Welcome everyone to another digital program here at the Walters. My name is Joy Davis and I am the manager of adult and community programs here at the Walters Art Museum. This evening, I have the pleasure of introducing two amazing staff Walters members, Ashley Dimmick, the Wheeler Mellon Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow in Islamic Art, and Gregory Bailey, Senior Objects Conservator. Welcome, Ashley and Greg. Hi. Hi. So today we're gonna to be talking about a few metalwork objects from the Islamic world. Um, but before we get into that, we kind of want to just give you a little insight as to um, how we work with these kinds of objects and why it requires collaboration. Greg, do you want to get started? Sure. So I, uh, again, my name is Gregory Bailey. I am one of the objects conservators at the Walters Art Museum. And that uh, encompasses a bunch of different tasks. So I and my colleagues in conservation work with our collections care staff to preserve the collection for the future. We work uh, to conserve the collection and do more of what you might think of as traditional restoration, so cleaning and preparing objects for exhibition. And we also work closely with our curatorial staff and our conservation scientist, Dr. Glenn Gates, to study materials in the collection, to answer questions like, what is something made out of? How is it made? And how has it changed over time? And this might seem like fairly straightforward questions, but with complex historical artworks, they can often be very difficult to answer. So it can take a lot of heads together to, to begin to um, really begin to answer questions about complex artworks in the collection. Ashley? Exactly. I mean, so my long title, um, essentially I'm functioning um, with as a curator in the curatorial department. Um, and among our many duties up there, um, we do research on the collection. Um, and this, uh, as I am a trained art historian, this requires various research methods of primary and secondary sources, looking at comparable objects, um, and working with our conservators like Greg to look at not only how an object was made and what it was made of, but really try and see its whole life. What are all the different hands um, that touch these things and what did it mean to them in, in different times and places. So we're going to hopefully look at a few of those uh, facets of a, of a different um, of the different objects we're going to be looking at today. So shall we get started? Please. Um, so first up we have here a, a metalwork ewer um, and this actually features in our new soon to be out collections guide called the Walters Art Museum excursions through the collection. So please uh, look out for that. Um, so this ewer is really just stunning and you might also see um, details of it on our banners because we will be reopening tomorrow. Um, so it's really a masterpiece and a highlight of the collection uh, and a real treasure. We have the artist's name here on the base of the neck, and his name was Yunus ibn Yusuf al-Nakash al-Mausili. So that tells us not only the artist's name, Yunus, but his father's name, Yusuf, and that his profession, al-Nakash, was as an artist or designer. And al-Mausili tells us he was from Mosul, which is located uh, in northwestern Iraq. And there was actually a really robust metalworking craft community in Mosul in this time. And shortly after making this ewer, um, so in the 1250s and 60s, this craft community really expanded and workshops were established in other cities like Damascus and Cairo. Um, in addition to the artist's name, we have other kinds of calligraphy, some nodding and interlace motifs. Uh, as well as figural scenes. And here's just a couple examples, like um, an archer on horseback and um, a, sort of a court scene with an individual kissing the hand of an enthroned king. One particular motif um, that might seem like it doesn't have as much, but is this, um, this interlaced um, And this motif um, really, link the, the production of this piece even further to the city of Mosul um, because most of the, the similar type of metalwork objects like this um, 
that have this motif can be really confirmed as being made in Mosul and not one of the other later metalworking centers. Um, but Greg, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the particulars of the materials and techniques that Eunice used to make this. Absolutely. Um, and uh, just as an introduction to that, I will say that you see three different views here, and this is actually three different points in time for this object. So before it was included in the most recent exhibition and photographed for our new uh, catalog excursions, um, it was cleaned. So the, the image that you see on the left is before treatment. The image that you see in the middle is after it, uh, I cleaned it. And the image that you see on the far left, um, on the far right, excuse me, is um, uh, as it appears in our, in our new uh, publication. So uh, before I explain how, how we clean the surfaces, it's important to know what the materials are. Um, so this is, this is really quite large. I think it's important to understand that, that the size of this, it's almost two feet tall. It's, uh, so it really, it's meant to be picked up and, and moved around with two hands. It's a pretty impressive thing. Uh, the actual physical structure is made out of brass. And brass is a kind of familiar alloy. It's copper and zinc and typically has this kind of warm yellowy tone to it. So that's been raised with a hammer into this, this really kind of elegant form with a kind of swelling body and an added handle and spout. To the surface of that, uh, everything that you saw that's kind of glittering here and that Ashley was showing some uh, close-up images before are actually thin sheets of silver that have been cut out to create those figural scenes and then many of the really complex interlace patterns. And then that particular last detail that we saw is actually gold inlay wire as well. So we have three different metals here, gold, silver, onto a brass substrate. And what might not be immediately apparent because not so much of this survives is that there's actually a fourth material on the surface. In many of the background areas that aren't inlaid, there's quite a bit of carved texture on the surface. And to enhance the contrast, uh, a black material has been applied to the surface, much of which has degraded or been lost, uh, but it's very likely a form of bitumen, which is like a kind of naturally occurring asphalt. So it's a tar-like substance, it's very black. So you have this interplay of kind of the warm yellow of the form, the mirror bright surface of the silver, this really bright yellow of the gold, and then the kind of heightening black contrast to throw that all into high relief. So this is a very densely patterned object. And as you can see in these two pictures on the right, depending on the angle of light, you actually see different portions of it. And it really glitters as you move it around. And if you think of this as a used object um, that you see at different points during the day or in flickering candlelight or lamp light, um, it's really kind of spectacular uh, surfaces here and an extraordinary amount of workmanship, not only physical labor to create all of this metal, create the form, inlay the surfaces, but also, as you were pointing out, that, that critical part of the artist's name is that he's a designer, that there's an enormous amount of planning and very careful layout that went into creating uh, this very kind of precise geometric interlace and really beautiful, um, uh, figural scenes as well in the different roundels on the surface. Um, so that sort of answers your question about some of the materials, but I know what you might want to know is um, how did we clean the surfaces? So um, as you might know, silver tarnishes over time, especially when it's exposed to sulfur pollutants and it can look very, very dark. And that's what we're seeing in this left-hand image is that silver surfaces appear dark, there's a little bit of black material there, and the brass surfaces appear dark as well. So we've lost a lot of the contrast that's intended with these different materials. So um, to very gently clean these thin silver surface layers, we use two different things. One, uh, this may look familiar to some among you, this is a polyurethane cosmetic sponge, um, which is very soft but uh, because it has pores like a sponge can actually pick up gently some of the um, silver tarnish on the surface. 
And the other thing, this may look familiar to any of those who are artists, um, particularly if you draw, uh, these, are, these are erasers um, that are also very soft, but a little bit firmer than the cosmetic sponge that allow us to, again, kind of gently and progressively pick up some of the silver tarnish without leaving anything behind on this very textured surface. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah. And I, I, I really appreciate you bringing in um, those sort of props and examples so we can see what you use. Cause I know, you know, when I, um, when we first started working together, I didn't know that those were techniques you could use. Um, so I learned things from you all the time, which I really appreciate. Uh, and I love that you brought in the, the sort of, um, thinking about light and candlelight and the way that these things would have glittered in space because it, it you know calls to mind how would these have been or something like this been used um and and as a ewer it's it's a multifunctional vessel um but when something like this is paired with a basin and i know you also have one of those in the lab right now you're working on um it could have been used for hand washing, so very timely in our current moment, where you can pour the water from the ewer into the basin and freely wash your hands um, in the flowing water. So um, very relevant as to what's going on right now. But speaking yeah. of your amazing job cleaning things, we can move to our next object. Um, so this is a, a celestial globe, and I want to give a shout out to our photographer, Ariel, for compiling this GIF. It's stunning, and I want to use it all the time. Um, so this globe is, I, I knew that it was in storage, and I went to find it, but it was it was so hard to see, because when you first look at looked at it, or when I first looked at it anyway, it, it was so dark, you really couldn't see any of what it was. It just looked like a cannonball on the shelf, almost. Um, but thankfully you took this project on and now we can see it in its full glory. So uh, the celestial globe is really just um, a 3D representation of the stars in the heavens. So we have here 123 inlaid stars formed in constellations, which are then named. We also have the equator, um, the different degrees, as well as signs of the zodiac. There's a lot of information given on this spherical surface. Uh, and this, we also have an inscription on the bottom. It's a little bit hard to read, um, but it does tell us that the globe was created using the information or the understanding of the um, observed heavens from the observatory in Samarkand. So I highlighted that on the map here, but it also tells us the date this was made using three different calendar systems, which I think is super interesting, which brings us to the middle of the 17th century of the common era. Um, and that's not to say this was made in Samarkand, but just use the scientific information developed there. Um, but Greg, I'd love to hear more about your cleaning processes with this and how you kind of figured out how it was made and how it was used. Yeah, um, maybe we can flip to the next slide, perfect. Um, so this, I think also it's important to get a sense of scale. It's kind of, it's it's just about kind of hand size. It's sort of the size of like a bocce ball or something. Um, so it's, it's not very large. It's a very kind of personally sized object. Um, and, Initially, it, it did look very, very dark. Uh, and again, that was because each of these little silver stars, which are actually inlaid plugs of silver in different sizes that relate to the brightness of the perceived brightness of the star, um, had tarnished very, very much. So we lo again lost the contrast between that mirror bright silver and the brass surfaces. And as you probably saw as the um, so you're seeing that spin in the, uh, the image before, again, it's very lighting dependent it's that you pick up these little pinpricks of, of light that show you the stars um, as, as you move across the surface. And uh, here in the image on the right, um, we're actually looking down at the North Pole. Um, so if you can imagine this as the fixed sphere of the heavens and the earth contained inside, um, that hole in the center would be the magnetic North Pole. And you see uh, the Big Dipper or Ursa Major there off to the off to the right hand side. Um, so again, using very similar methods, I uh, was able to gently increase the contrast between the silver 
and the brass surface. This is also a brass, um, but it's very worn. And you might have seen that the kind of the, the top portion and the bottom portion um, have a very kind of dark overall worn patina to it. Um, and that's partly, again, thinking about how this thing was actually used. Uh, that's really a sign of handling, of touch, of someone moving it uh, through a stand. So just like a normal library globe that we would have today, it would have an uh, uh, equatorial and meridional uh, kind of cage to hold it in so that it could be freely rotated around. And we're missing that part of the original. Um, and maybe in a moment, Ashley, you can tell us about uh, if we have any plans uh, for that in the future. Um, but then on the left here, just before moving on, I wanted to point out that this, this is an x-ray of, uh, of the globe itself. So we're seeing, just as you might x-ray a broken bone, we're actually seeing all the way through the object. Um, so we see all four sets of mounting holes here. And that kind of Saturn's ring in the center is the seam between the two parts. So this was actually made in two hemispheres. And if you've ever tried to draw a perfect circle or model a perfect sphere in clay or any other material, it's really tough to make it perfectly even. And this is a heavy cast metal. So it's actually quite impressive that this was cast and then trued or trimmed up to be almost a very perfect sphere in two halves that was uh, then soldered together. Um, so given that we don't have a mount, and we've talked about the importance of lighting, uh, and we know that this will probably be included in an upcoming exhibition, do you have plans for uh, how we might mount this? I mean, I, yeah, I, I have lots of big plans and thinking about new and dynamic ways of displaying objects. So we'll see what's possible and um, what the rest of the team comes up with too. So, um, I think we'll, we're gonna jump ahead a couple more centuries. So we've gone from the 13th to the 17th to now the 19th century. Um, this is one of my favorite objects in the collection. Um, and this is a, a good example of why we need to keep doing research on these objects. Um, so this is a flat piece of metal used for printing. And it was originally thought that maybe this was made for printing pilgrimage certificates. So when um, a Muslim could, went to Mecca on pilgrimage would get some sort of certificate um, authenticating their visit or as a kind of souvenir. But looking more closely at the composition of this, um, we now think it's much more likely to be a hillier which I'll, I'll sort of get into more um, detail of what that is, um, but that it would print hillier for, for people to hang in their homes. So what is a hillier? So this composition here with the, the sort of large circle in the center with subsidiary circles and this real flood of text um, is a form that was developed in the 17th century um, as a kind of calligraphic icon, but you could hang this in a mosque or in a home that could then um, bestow blessings on that space. Um, if we look more closely, we actually also have depictions of the holy cities of Mecca and Medina on here. And this might be able to give you a little bit uh, more sense of the detail of this thing. Um, but really, you could then, um, because hand calligraphed hillier would be quite expensive, but having one that was printed um, made it much more economical. So it, it it allowed people of lesser means um, than the courtly elite, for example, to have access to this kind of an object. So I think that's um, particularly cool. And so just to place this in, in, in time and space as well, um, just to highlight here Mecca on the map, but also this really could have been made um, anywhere in the, the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottomans did control the holy cities of Mecca and Medina in this time. So um, we could also think of really like the mobility of objects. So this would have been made somewhere um, representing the holy cities, um, but then the paper objects could have been disseminated all over the world. So there's really a, a, a sort of connectivity here um, through material objects, which I really love. But do you want to say more here about also how this was made and what evidence there is of its use? 
Sure. Yeah. So again, this is this is um, what we're looking at is not so much an ornamental object itself. This is really a, a tool for mass producing or or at least repetitively producing printed uh, materials. And correct me if I'm wrong, but we're talking about printing on paper here. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and again, in, in terms of sense of scale here, this, this plate is actually a little bit smaller than a kind of standard piece of like printer paper. So it's, it's not tiny, but it's not huge either. Um, this is also made out of brass. So uh, we've looked at uh, all three of these objects are brass, which is a copper and zinc alloy. And here you see the back face on the left side and front face uh, on the right side. The back face has a kind of pattern to it and that shows us that it was hammered out into a sheet, so it's somewhat thin. Um, and then on the front face, uh, what's what's interesting, you, you, I think as we could see in that detail, is that it's very densely packed with text and images and um, figure uh, and uh, diagrams, um, but they're all in reverse. And uh, the reason for that is if you are inking the front of this so that there's ink in all of the reserves and then you press a piece of paper on there, when you peel them apart, they're mirror images of each other. Um, so if you want your, your print to turn out the right way around, you need to write everything in reverse, uh, which is no mean feat, especially when you're doing it with a very sharp chisel in a piece of metal. Um, so one of the things is that it's very kind of hard to interpret the, the text and the imagery on this object uh, because we don't have the corresponding print. So what you see here is actually a reflected infrared photograph. I realized in looking at the surfaces that we there are still traces of ink in many of the, the reserves on the front face and they absorb infrared radiation very well, whereas the metal surface reflects. So in capturing that infrared image and then flipping it, um, this gives a really good indication of what that print would have looked like if we were to print the surface of this object here. And you can begin to see how really dense um, all of that text and ornamentation are. And here you see again, those two representations of Mecca and Medina, the two holy cities there. Um, so actually, I know that you, you've done quite a bit of research on this and we know that maybe the form itself has been modified. Um, can you just mention our thoughts maybe about that top portion there? Yeah, I'll go, I'll go back here so you can see. Sure. Um, so you can see the, this uh, ring in the center. So this is a later edition. We think that perhaps there was a little like filial, maybe in the shape of a fleur-de-lis based on comparisons in um, other collections. Um, and that this hook or this ring was probably added um, much later to, to show it as an object unto itself. Um, but something that I think uh, that you've pointed out to me before, which I, I thought was really telling, is these two wings on, on each side have, um, are slightly bent or, or, or sort of, moved in a certain way and there is if you look closely and under especially when using all of your um, great imaging techniques you can see sort of those stress fractures of use right yes yeah so um this isn't this isn't perfectly flat and and yes indeed those two kind of wings at the side are bent and we do see that that center part where the the loop is has been filed down so that might suggest that we, there was something that broke there. And if you think about either using a roller or something hard and flat to press across this to print onto paper, um, you, you risk kind of bending it a little bit. And if you've ever bent uh, like a paper clip back and forth until it breaks, uh, that's what we call stress cracking. Um, so the, the actual crystalline structure of the metal changes as you subject it to that kind of tension over time um, and torsion. Uh, so we see that kind of evidence of use, not only the remnants of the ink on the front face, but the kind of physical stress of the printing process on the plate itself. Um, just to come full, full circle here, I mean, I have to say it's been such a, an honor and pleasure to be able to see these objects with you in the conservation lab at the Walters. Um, seeing them under 
different light, especially all the natural light flooding in, like the printing plaque have that beautiful iridescent sheen. And you really get a sense of sort of the aura of the object in a different way than um, in the gallery sometimes. And even like things like new technologies, like creating a GIF helps, um, helps give that essence over the sort of digital sphere here. Um, do we have any final thoughts or do we want to take comments or questions? Yeah, I think if we if we have any questions or uh, Joy, if you want to chime in, uh, we'd be happy to. I think we've learned a lot. Uh, there's so much I've, I'm learning. There's so much in the details of these objects. So, uh, you know, it makes it makes you want to actually come into the space and like look at them close up. Of course, you can't touch them. Uh, but hopefully um, this has kind of given you a, a deeper dive into um, some of these objects that have so many little details. There are so many questions. And that's amazing. We love you all for that. And so I will start with Antonia. Um, back then, back then, did they reapply the tar-like stuff uh, periodically? They they forget the name. Uh, they apologize. Uh, or was it a one-time application? That's a really good question. Um, and I'm not certain that I can answer that. Uh, I will say that uh, once it dries and it sets, it's very much like asphalt on the street. Uh, that it doesn't dissolve in water, or even if you know you were using wine in one of one of these types of vessels, uh, that you wouldn't you wouldn't see it wash off um, as you're using it. It's really much more gradual process of wear and deterioration. Um, so I I don't know. Um, it it's not something that you would have to reapply like every time that you used it. Um, uh, the next question we have is with the designer who, and this is from Meredith, would the designer who developed the patterns and inlays also have been uh, the craftsman who created the shapes and the physical pieces of silver and gold wire? And then the second question is, or would that have been two different people producing that work? There may have been many more than just two. Um, so Eunice being the, the designer of these things, but um, you really, especially for these highly developed um, meticulous crafts work, you have specialists working in the different media and different areas, different motifs and that kind of thing. So a lot of these things are real workshop productions. So they require the, the hands of many um, master artists. And I think it's, it's always worth pointing out that um, there are many more people involved in the production. If you go back to your raw materials, that this came out of the ground as rocks that were turned into metal, that were then turned into intentional alloys, that were then prepared as artist materials. So, um, you know, if you think back in terms of how many hands went into, I mean, just the sheer amount of physical labor that went into creating something like this, um, that's really kind of what imbues it with so much, um, so much majesty, really. Yeah, once we start thinking about the raw material, it really puts it in perspective, like the process, but also the reverence for certain objects uh, throughout history. And Jan or Jan uh, would like to ask, would all of the text and images have been drawn on the brass sheet for the engraver to carve? That's a good question. Hmm. That is a good question. I haven't seen, I haven't seen evidence of drawn lines. I think we're talking about the, the plaque, the printing plaque, yes? Um, Greg, do you remember seeing any evidence of lines? That's not to say that they didn't, um, but I don't there, remember seeing any physical evidence. Well, to, yeah, um, the, the, the text and all the designs are cut with a very sharp V-shaped graver. Um, so if there were, you know, very thin, like pinpoint lines, they would have actually been removed as the, um, as the graver went across the surface and cut a groove in, um, unless there were any mistakes, and I haven't noticed any. Right. Um, the other thing is that this, as we were talking about this, the, the printing plate shows a significant amount of wear, but this was used a lot. Um, so the, a lot of the surface ha has a very kind of worn quality, some fine scratches to it. There's a little bit of corrosion. Actually, as you were mentioning, there's this kind of iridescent um, oxidized surface. Uh, so we don't see strong indications of that, but that's not to say that it's not possible. Awesome. It doesn't look like we have any other questions. I have one selfish question to ask you all. Maybe that'll drum up a few more. But 
it, out of these three objects, do you have a favorite uh, and why? <laughs> I know this will be the hardest question to ask Ashley. <laughs> I'm gonna use a cop out and say that what I love about these all was the, the th thrill of discovery. Mm. Um, and being, yeah, just being able to see things in such an intimate context, you fall in love with every little detail. So it's, it's you know, it's hard to choose, but just that, um, yeah, that that thrill of discovery, learning something new, doing more research. I mean, that's that's what gets us excited about doing what we do. And Gray, uh, I wish I could give the same answer. I I would have to say, I would have to say it's the globe because it's such an amazingly cool. I didn't even really know that such things existed before I started to work on this one and learned a lot about. It's a really complex thing, and we didn't quite even get into how um, mathematically complex the layout of, of this object is. I learned a lot about um, ancient and classical astronomy and the transmission of, of uh, astronomical and zodiacal knowledge from the classical world um, through to the Islamicate world. Uh, and it, it's, it seems, I mean, this is a cheesy thing to say, but it's kind of a whole world into itself, um, which I'm I'm really glad that that you know we have this extraordinary object to share in the galleries and begin to tell some of those stories about science, about the transmission of knowledge, um, and about this amazing uh, the kind of amazing history of this technique of of silver inlay into brass. Well, we have I. Uh was able to inspire two more questions. And so uh, we'll end with those. Uh, Allison asked, how does an object end up in the lab? Does every object get cleaned by uh, a conservator or by conservation? And I actually think that this maybe both of you can answer this question because it is a it is a tandem decision, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons. Um, for example, the, the printing plaque needed to come off view to make room for a different exhibition. So it was an opportune moment to have a closer look. Um, but also while we're preparing for new exhibitions, uh, we want to make sure that the objects are in their very best condition and stable to go on view. So they always need to be um, assessed by our, our stellar conservation team. Greg? Um, yes, I think I think it's important to point out that about 90% of our collection, uh, which numbers on the order of 36 or 37,000 objects, um, so 90% of that is in storage at any one point in time. Um, so as Ashley and our curatorial colleagues begin to plan new exhibitions, new installations, um, there's a lot of looking to be done and reassessing uh, of materials and storage. And we are also an institution that loans to other museums and institutions around the world. So when other exhibitions are being planned, we are often approached uh, to loan objects as well. Um, so it's really much of the conservation work that we do is driven either by installations, exhibitions, or loans. Um, or really research interests, um, you know, and, and publishing our, our new um, handbook, uh, Excursions Through the Collections. You know, we had to do a lot of looking at even very familiar objects. Um, so it's, it's sort of a combination of, of different factors, and, it's, and it always involves more than one person to make that decision. I think that's very key. Oftentimes people wonder about that. It's not just one, it's always a team, it takes a village. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> uh, Antonia asks, how did ancient civilizations clean silver objects when they were tarnished? I don't know if you know the answer to this. I know it does vary depending on the culture, uh, but maybe this particular object or maybe what was practically used or traditionally used? Um. That's that is something that people often ask because uh, you know if you have like a silver tea set or or anything at home you know that it's hard to keep it looking bright and shiny. Um, one really important thing to consider is that prior to about 1800, prior to the Industrial Revolution, atmospheric sulfur levels were relatively low. That when we think about trying to preserve bright silver today, what we're really fighting against is the Industrial Revolution. 
Um, so things prior to about 1800 didn't tarnish as fast or as severely as they tend to do today in major uh, cities like Baltimore and major industrial areas in uh, North America and the West um, that were really kind of fighting against that, that very modern history. Um, that said, if you, if you use silver objects frequently um, and wash them and then dry them, because if you don't dry them off, they tend to get that little speckly water spots on them. Um, just that little gentle bit of, of kind of washing and then buffing is often enough uh, to prevent kind of hard black tarnish from forming. Um, so I, I don't know that that answers your question exactly, but um, it's, it's uh, something that, that people often ask, and it's something that I think about a lot as well. Ashley, did you have... I just learned something new again, which is why I always like working with you. So I never thought about it in, in terms of like sort of fighting the um, the advent of the industrial revolution. But uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And the last question I have, because it is kind of plugging our collection, where can visitors see this work? Is it going to be on view anytime soon? Can they go to art.thewalters.org to see this work? Where can we find it? You can absolutely see it on the website. Um, the, each of these are in spaces in the museum that are not open as of yet, is, is my understanding. Yes. Um, right. Let's so, zoom ish. <laughs> you know, we're, we're rolling it out as um, our, our reopening plans. Uh, you can see the other, the rest of the Islamic objects on view uh, in our Center Street building on the third floor. Um, so please come see what other treasures we have in all different media, not just metal work. Yes, and our digital team is letting us know that we are reopening tomorrow, September 16th. Uh, hopefully by the time that you watch this afterwards, it'll be open. Uh, so yeah, you should go and check those out. There is a beautiful banner of the Uwer though. So that's that's a treat. Um, thank you all for joining us here today. I wanna thank my wonderful, 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 wonderful uh, hosts and moderators today, Greg and Ashley for presenting today on, on some really uh, wonderful objects. And I wanna last but not least, thank our digital team for making this possible. Without this would not happen. And uh, thank you again to, to the audience for your great questions. And we will see you in the next program. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Joy. Yeah.